Marhaba. Right now we're going to talk about vu, which is a word in Arabic that we can use in formal contexts to talk about possession. You probably know a couple of other ways to express possession in Arabic, particles like li or ind that take a pronoun suffix to go along with them. Li ach, I have a brother, or einduhu kitab, he has a book. Vu, however, is distinct in a couple of ways. Number one, we tend to use it to talk about specific kinds of possession. In particular, possession of abstract qualities, like talking about someone having experience or having principles. And the other main situation where we see it is when we're talking about permanent or semi-permanent physical characteristics, like having brown eyes or having uh, black hair, things like that. It is very formal. We're unlikely to hear it in normal vernacular speech. It's unlikely to be overheard in a conversation, but it is used in formal context, so we need to be prepared to grapple with it. Lu is one of the so-called five names, al-asma al-khamsa in Arabic, that take distinct long vowel endings when they are part of an idafa. The difference with dhu, and we have another video on asma al khamsa that you can go look at if you'd like a refresher on how they work typically, but dhu is sort of distinctive in that, number one, we're only ever going to see it as the first part of an idafa because it kind of means having or possessing, having brown hair, having blue eyes, having great experience, and it has separate forms in masculine and feminine, dual, and plural. This chart may look a little bit intimidating, but a lot of the grammar that you already know is applicable in this case. If you see these columns here, we have separate variants of lu for marfu'a, mansub, and majrur cases. Now, if you look at the waw, alif, and ya here, you'll notice that they correspond to the short vowel markings that we could expect on the end of a singular noun. If a singular noun were in marfu'a, we would expect to see one or two vammas at the end. If it were in mansub, we would expect to see one or two fathas. And if it were in majrur, we would expect to see one or two kasras at the end. So the waw is the long vowel sound that corresponds to bamma. The alif is the long vowel sound that corresponds to kasra, short a sound. And the ya corresponds to the short i, kasra sound. Same thing here in the feminine versions. We have a bamma, a fatha, and a kasra. So it's much like the grammar that you already know if you have spent some time learning about i'rab, Arabic case endings. So too, when we look at the dual and plural forms, it may seem a little bit arbitrary, but remember that lu in any of these versions is always the first word of an idafa. So take the masculine dual version. It's a bit like we tacked on that an ending that we know from dual, but we would remove the nun if any word were part of an idafa or the male plural version, it's almost as though we tacked on the un and then removed the nun because of its place at the beginning of an idafa. Like if we were talking about the employees of the company in formal Arabic, that idafa would look like this. Muwadhafu al-sharika. Because in an idafa, that nun that would ordinarily be there has to disappear. It's just a rule of formal Arabic. And we have a separate video on that process as well, if you'd like a refresher. Let's take a look at some examples. If we wanted to say, for example, in formal Arabic, do you know the student with long hair? Let's make her a woman. Do you know the female student with long hair? هل تعرف الطالبة? Now, since طالبة is the object of تعرف, it's going to take a mansub 
case ending. It's going to take a fatha. So I know that taliba is mansub, and therefore, so the student having the long hair, I need to go to the feminine mansub version of this word, and I wind up with theta. Ashar al-tawil. Remember again, leta is technically the first word of an idafa, so the noun and the adjective describing the noun that follow are going to be majrur because they are non-first words of an idafa. So we would add a kasra onto those words in a fully vocalized sentence. Another example, um, we need employees who have experience. We could say in Arabic, نحتاج إلى موظفين Now, موظفين is majroor with ya nun, not waw nun because it comes after a preposition, a harf jar, illa. And that means that I'm talking about multiple employees in the majroor, so I need the masculine plural majroor version of lu, which is the we. The we khibra. And since this is technically an idafa, an indefinite idafa, I would also need to include a kasra on the second word, but it would take tanwin, khibratin. Another example, in our house, there are two cats with green eyes. Two cats that have green eyes. So, in this case, I might, in formal Arabic, use a fronted predicate, put that prepositional phrase first. Fi baytina. Now this is the mubtada, the subject of a jumla ismiya. So it's going to be marfu'a, which means I'm going to need to use the marfu'a version, and it's going to need to be in the dual. So, feminine, because qitta in the singular is feminine. Notice here I have two variations, since vu is a very formal word and people are likely to pull it out as a way of kind of showing off their eloquence in Arabic. They might go for one or the other. They might pick the one that seems more obscure just to show off a little bit. So we'll go with version number one, veta, but we could go with the veta. Veta. Ayun Khudra One last thing that you should know about Ru is that in the plural in Al-Jam'a Al-Mudhakkar sometimes this is used as a synonym for Ahl, family or more specifically parents so if we wanted to say she lives far from her family, in a very formal register of Arabic. We could say taskun, or he ya taskun, if we really wanted to include that pronoun. Ba'idan an. And now that would be far from, since an is a harf jar. I need to use the majroor version, far from her family, the we, and then I would add the possessive suffix ha at the very end. An. The we ha. She lives far from her parents. 
Once again, Vu is a very formal structure. Um, you may not need to use it ever at all in your own writings, or you could put it there just to demonstrate to the world how very thorough your knowledge of Arabic structures is. However, you are likely to encounter it in contexts where someone is writing for eloquence, um, and it is part of what makes us able to demonstrate our knowledge of the fine points of Arabic grammar if we use it ourselves.